Thank you very much for those very kind words of welcome, and good evening, everybody. And I hope the next, well, 35, 45 minutes, we can talk together about the gift of faith and what it means and how the church understands the gift of faith. In starting, I would like, first of all, to thank Father Michael, who I asked to come here. How long ago is it, Michael, now? No, it's not. <laughs> A couple of years ago, and to begin to look at this parish and its church and its property and see how it could be developed at the service of young people in the diocese today. And at the same time, he's gone. I would like to thank Father David. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Okay. As our youth chaplain in the diocese, and to thank him for the work that he is starting with great enthusiasm among young people in the diocese. So those two put a lot of work into this, and both for Father Michael and for Father David, a little round of applause, please, to thank them very much. Now, what I'd like to do is this. I would like to speak with you now just for about six or seven or eight minutes. Then I'm going to offer you three questions just to talk about quickly, sincerely, concisely with those with whom you're sitting. Then I want to hear a little bit about what you've said. Not long discussions, the main points. And then I want to speak again and speak more kind of step by step about how the church understands faith. And by that time, it'll be about half past eight, 20 to nine, and then I finish. Okay? Faith. The year of faith. Many, many words are being spoken about faith at this time. The Holy Father invites us to deepen our faith, to renew our faith, to be confident in sharing our faith. And that's the task that we have for this year of faith. Here's my first thought, and I hope it stays with you and you can explore it more in your own time. Faith is, if you wish, a bit like a golden coin. A golden coin, which as we've heard, is a very precious gift. And on this coin, as with every other coin, there are two sides. And the two sides of the coin of faith can be described on one side as the faith and on the other side as my faith. But those two always have to stay together. So, the faith, the faith of the church, the faith that we've heard proclaimed this evening in the words of the creed, the faith that has a content to it, the faith that is described and put before us as dogmas. Now that's a heavy sounding word, but dogma means a saving truth. So a truth that has power to take us forward and, as it were, to open up ever-increasing horizons which will bring us to where we should be, saving. So the faith has a content, has a clear expression, and it has an authority of the Church of Christ behind it. And that is one side of the coin of faith. Turn the coin over and the other side is my faith. And that's to do, as we have heard already this evening, of my living day by day relationship with the Lord. Whether I understand the Lord as my Father 
as Jesus, my brother, as the Holy Spirit of that breath and life and love within me, that mystery of the Trinity into which I am called as a person is my faith. And my faith is nurtured and deepened in all sorts of different ways, especially, we would say, in the life of the church. The faith and my faith have to go together. You can have a coin and you might find a coin and its sides, its faces have been worn smooth and you can't really tell too much detail on that side of the coin. That can happen to our faith on either side of the coin. So we can have, for example, quite a profound and heartfelt and sincere my faith. But the other side of the coin might be barely etched at all. It might just be shiny with the slightest outlines of some content. My faith might need the other side of the coin sketching out and deepening again in its outline and content. My faith needs the faith. And similarly, it may be that on another coin, the side of the faith is very strongly etched. Maybe somebody can recite the creed. They can argue every case. They're very good at apologetics. They can be very fervent and deliberate about the content of the faith. But maybe the other side of the coin is a bit shallow and a bit, as it were, not kind of digging in to their heart and into the way they live. So our project in the year of faith is not to concentrate on one side or the other, but to see how the precious coin of our faith can be refreshed on both sides. The faith of the church lived as my faith. The content of faith finding its home in my heart. My heart and vigor expressing and giving words and actions to the faith of the church. And that's the first image I hope you can understand, take on board, and think about over and again in the weeks ahead. Now, three questions for you. Are you very attentive? I'm just going to give you five minutes to think through these three things, just with two or three people round about. What do you understand by the word faith? First question. What do you personally understand by the word faith? Second question. What are some of the key things, influences, in your pathway to faith? We've heard one story already this evening. Just for each of you, what has brought you to faith? And thirdly, how is your faith nourished? Where do you find it nurtured and strengthened and sustained? Three questions. What do you mean by the word faith? What are the influences that bring you to faith? How is your faith nourished? How and where is your faith nourished and strengthened? Faith, not so visible, but its fruits are very measurable and very evident. Excellent. The beauty of faith. So faith is the deepest part of a person. A lovely expression. It's the core of their being. Very nice. Faith is trust. Excellent. Thank you. So faith and life are inseparable. Yeah, the life I have and the faith I have are absolutely locked together. So there's a sense of faith being presented and you have a choice. Receive it or don't. Open your heart to it or don't. 
Yeah, black and white was the first. A living relationship with God? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. A key thought. Faith strengthened by community. So faith gives you a sense of joy and contentment and the other word you used was productivity, was it? Positivity. Posi positivity casts a whole style of living, as it were. Thank you very much indeed. So there is faith as a gift of God, a supernatural gift of God, which takes us beyond our natural capacities. Thank you very much indeed. Faith as stepping out of the boat. There we are, rooted in a picture in the scripture of Peter stepping onto the water and then sinking. Right. Right, there you go. Faith comes in all sorts of packages. Mother, son, grandmother and a story. Documentary. A, a documentary. And Catholic education. And Catholic education. Very important. So faith nourished through practical service. So in that sense, if I may put it like this, faith doesn't have any roots except in your heart. So wherever you are, you can take your greatest treasure with you and find your poise and positivity wherever you are. And maybe find a community too wherever you are. Okay, good. Because what I'd like to do is very quickly go through some of the points that are made about how we come to faith and its basic shape from the UCAT. I'm not going to refer to the pages, but if you want to go over and read again some of the things that I'm going to say now, they're mostly to do with section one in the UCAT, so you can read them later. Here's some key thoughts about faith. One, it is written into our hearts. So, in other words, we are made to know God. As human beings, there is, as Cardinal Hume used to say, a space within us that only God can fill. So there is, if you like, a readiness, an affinity between our nature and the call of faith. And that's why faith often comes in so many different shapes and sizes, in so many different circumstances, and finds a home in the human heart, because actually we're made for it. There's almost in every culture a religious expression, an expression a searching for something that is going to fill that longing, that instinct within us. But at this very basic level, that can be blocked, it can be frustrated by the way we live or the circumstances in which we live. So while faith offers the most intimate part of ourselves an openness and a satisfaction, that can be shut off if it's never attended to or if we're totally absorbed in other things or if we've turned, as, one or two, as the gentleman said at the back, if we turn ourselves deliberately away from that capacity within us. And the last point in this first little block, faith is the source of our deepest and most lasting joy. We sang that if it is a deeply embedded capacity within the human spirit, if it lies unanswered, then we are unfulfilled. If it is answered, then we find something flowing from deep, deep down inside our human nature into a kind of sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and joy. So that first point is that we are made for faith. We, every single human person has a capacity to believe, a capacity for faith. That's the first thing. A second thing. How does the church understand the natural ways of coming to faith? What's the next step? What often evokes an openness within us to that natural capacity and begins the journey towards its fulfillment? Two things, because we could explain all of these in great detail. Two things. 
the created world and its beauty, other people and their goodness. So those two things are often of our natural living order, the doorways into the pathway of faith. When we see beauty, in whatever form we might perceive it, a work of art, the face of another person, the beauty of a landscape, the beauty that we might see down a microscope, we can either say, isn't that fantastic? Isn't that remarkable? And stop there. Or we can say, isn't this remarkable? Where does it come from? Who is the author of such beauty? What is its origin? So we either stay with the next to last step, which is perceiving and understanding and responding to the beauty, or we take another step and say, where's this from? Who's put this together? Where, who is the maker of this? And then when we look around and see the people around us and we're astonished by their generosity, by their good, this is anybody, astonished by their courage, astonished by those virtues, we again can admire that and then we can go another step and say how is it that somebody lives with such selflessness? Where does that come from? And so we have those ways of approaching faith which are still nowhere near the, what we're going to speak about as revelation, as God's opening of himself to us but they're the first building blocks by which that capacity within us for faith is opened up and its architecture begins to appear. What does the church tell us about our knowledge of God along this pathway that we're walking? First thing the church tells us is that Knowledge of God with some certainty is possible by the use of reason. Knowledge of the existence of a creator, of a being whom people call God, is possible by the use of reason. Cardinal John Henry Newman used to talk about converging and convincing arguments. And some of you will know the pattern of some of those arguments. We don't need to go into them now, but it is an affirmation by the church that reason, looking at the order of the world, asking about its origins, asking about its beauty, those kind of structured arguments can take us to the point of saying there must be. There must be something that traditionally people have called God. But Surrounded as we are by contrary voices, by difficulties, that is often a very difficult path to walk. But it is an important path to at least have a view of, to understand a bit. Because as we shall see a bit later, one of the great arguments that is in our society is that faith in God is irrational that it is against reason, that faith in God is a sign of immaturity. It's a sign of a people or a culture that has never grown up. It's a sign of our timidity of wanting to step out and be self-sufficient human beings. Now, against that argument are all the things that I've said to this point, that in fact, a proper understanding of human nature shows that we have a capacity. The world around us gives us pointers. Reason can give us arguments. And all of those things add to the very important affirmation that faith and reason go together and together open up the fullness of truth and beauty of the human person. Another little heading 
which is important for us to remember. What does the church tell us about speaking about God, about language of God, if you like, about God talk? Now, this is important too, because this saves us from going overboard, if you like. We only ever have limited knowledge of God, and therefore every attempt we make to speak about God is only limited. We can never find the words, the expressions, to fully speak out the truth of God. So that makes us, how should I say, diffident. That makes us humble. That makes us less than, as it were, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, somebody who just shouts all the time. It makes us recognize the mystery of God and that this is something which is beyond us to which we are always striving, never possessing. In technical language, we say we only speak of God by analogy. So something I see is good here, I can see something of God and extend it and extend it and extend it and I'm getting a little bit of insight into God. So we speak of God as Father by analogy. We understand something of human fatherhood. And by analogy then we apply that to God. But it's an imperfect image. But we try. That's why in our life of faith we are constantly searching. And constantly, as you were, trying to be more sensitive in the way we speak about God. In the way we try and express God. There is a phrase in the Catechism that says we can never speak of God without, as it were, realizing more and more the distance between us. So there is no similitude without greater dissimilitude. So every time we get close to saying something about God, we will realize that we're actually quite far from him. So, what is crucial when we come to the end of that series of points about the human capacity for God, what is absolutely crucial then is the importance of the gift of God showing himself to us, the gift of God's revelation. And that's the key, if you like, in our Catholic Christian understanding of God. God reveals himself to us because left to ourselves we will never, as it were, enter the relationship for which we have been made. And that gives rise to a very important notion of our first response to God's revelation. It is a response of obedience. So we speak about the obedience of faith. And it's typified for us in the figure of Abraham, who is willing to sacrifice his son. It is typified for us in the figure of Mary, who gives her whole self, body, soul, flesh, blood, in obedience to God and her faith in God. But notice that the word obedience has its root and its meaning in the verb to listen. So obedience comes from listening, from listening to God speaking to us about himself, God opening himself to us, and then we respond with a yes, a yes that is willing then to trust and to act. So. We can say that listening and receiving the gift of faith is beginning to give the shape to our Christian faith. We believe in God alone who shows himself. We hold Jesus to be the eternal word of God, the way, the fullest expression of God's revelation. And we believe in the Holy Spirit who moves within us 
and draws us to that self-revelation of God. Just a few more things. You can read a lot of these later in the UCAT, but I think it's worth putting them out systematically for you. When you have a look in it, don't forget to look at question 21, because it's quite an important question. What are the characteristics of faith as understood in the Catholic Church? Firstly, it's a grace. We had that, somebody said it over this side, and you see what I think is wonderful. Most of the content of the Catechism has already been expressed in your responses. So you are giving voice to the faith of the church, bit by bit, piece by piece. The Catechism draws all that together and helps us to study it. So faith is a gift of grace. Blessed are you, Simon Peter, because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So it's right that we pray for the gift of faith. It's right that we pray for the gift of faith for those who seem not to have it or to be letting go of it. It's right that we ask God to strengthen our faith. In our prayer for this holy year, we say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that prayer for faith can be a constant refrain in our lives. Yet, this grace becomes a human act. It becomes an act that we make, an act of will, an act of mind, and an act of love. So it's not a, a, a grace, as it were, that zaps us and renders us helpless. It is, as somebody said, a gift of grace that enables us to go beyond our natural capacity, exactly as you said, and it raises our human capacity to a level of human act which then begins to build and complete us. Thirdly, faith is an understanding of the truth. That's important. Faith is not a fantasy, it's an understanding of the truth. Why? Because it comes from God who does not deceive and cannot be deceived. If God is God, then God does not deceive. It would be a nonsense to speak of God who deceives. Nor is God deceived. So when we are engaged and trying to walk that pathway of faith, what God wants for us is to understand the truth. And that is fully expressed in the person of Jesus. That doesn't mean to say we get the truth all the time, that we, as it were, have grasped it fully. But it does mean to say what we are searching for is the truth of God. Now, in our society today, that's a major, major problem. Because in the culture in which we live, in the air in which you and I breathe every day, the assumption is there is no such thing as the truth. The assumption has become that you have your truth, and I have my truth, and they have their truth, and that's all there is. So the notion of truth has splintered, and there's bits of it, reflections, fragments of it, all over. But this faith is different. This faith says this is the gift of God, of truth, in Christ, and it is attainable. We will attain it in its fullness in heaven, but that is the journey we wish to walk, and it is the journey of the truth of God. On this journey, as I've indicated already, we are always seeking understanding. We never possess that truth. Therefore, its pathway is one of study and conversation, theology and dialogue. We are always ready to try and learn something more from all the surrounding and surprising circumstances of God's created world and of men's best efforts to respond to him. This 
response of faith, this gift of grace, this human act, this search for the truth requires our freedom. Therefore, the journey of faith can never be a journey of coercion. You cannot force somebody to believe. That is a contradiction in terms. And when we understand the nature of faith, then we know what we must do is propose and invite. Now, when children are very small, when parents are bringing them to life through all those years of infancy, they don't simply propose and invite. You don't say to a screaming six-month-old baby, here's your lunch if you want it, and if you don't, leave it. You feed the baby, and so on gradually as they come through. So too with the habits of faith. We, as it were, shape young lives so that they have the chance to understand as best as possible what the free invitation of faith and the free response to faith is as they grow in capacity for it. But in its essence, faith is always a free response. Just to skip over a couple, another characteristic of faith is that it is necessary for our full salvation. So in other words, I have to entrust myself to God, coming back to that trust of faith, if I'm going to allow the work of salvation in me. And one last characteristic of faith, it is, it perseveres. It perseveres, and, and I think that's a very important characteristic for you to hang on to. I'm just looking at the clock. I'm going to stop in another two minutes. These are some of the characteristics of faith as understood in the Catholic Church. One more, and it's already been mentioned, faith draws us irrevocably into community. Faith can never be a solitary path because it is, as you have said, an opening up of relationships with God and with other people because we begin to see them in the eyes of faith and see in them our brothers and sisters, those to whom we belong. Now, in the world today, in our, the world in which we live, there's lots of talk about spirituality as a good thing and lots of talk about religion as a bad thing. And I think it's important that we just take a moment for each of those words. Spirituality is, if you like, the ability, the skill, the pattern of living my life in the presence of God. That's what a spirituality is. Those things, those practices, those habits of mind, which help me, as somebody said over there, to live always in the presence of God. So spirituality is a bit like a bridge. It connects me and God. Religion is the practices of a community of faith. And what that does, and these are two very important words, what religion does is connects me to other people and it corrects me when I'm going wrong. So to belong to a community of faith, a religion, ensures that I'm connected and when necessary, corrected. Because I can do neither if I stay on my own. So spirituality needs religion. And religion obviously needs spirituality. So that, keep that in mind. When you go in a bookshop today, the shelves and shelves of spirituality and practically nothing about religion. That's because we live in an age of deep individualism. But the great gift of faith connects us to others and it helps then in the community for us to be corrected. Right. There's a quick run through some of the characteristics of faith as understood in the Catholic Church 
most of them already expressed by you, and I want to stop now. I want to give you two or three minutes just to see if there are questions that you want to put to me. And then by a quarter to two, we'll finish this and come back to you. So a little break, and at the end of this break, free questions. Whatever you want to ask, I will do my best to answer. And for these questions, we'll have the roving microphone. So just take two or three minutes, and then we we'll take any questions that you wish to put. That's a very good question. That's a very, very good question. Depends what question you've asked God. Because if you've asked God the question, should I really do what my mother says? Then your mother will give you the answer on behalf of God. <laughs> if you're like me and ask God a question like, will Liverpool win on Thursday night? You learn with time that God lets happen what's going to happen. And it's the wrong kind of question. If you ask God, what do you want me to do with my life? Then, like for any other answer, first of all, you have to listen very hard. And in order to listen very hard, you have to have in your life the practice of being quiet at times with God. So you have to have in your life the practice of trying to be in God's presence and let God be God and you and me keep quiet. And I'll tell you something, it's very difficult to do because mostly we're so busy with our own thoughts, we're so busy maybe trying to impress God with what we're saying that we forget that God is God and I should just be there waiting, waiting. Waiting before God is very difficult, but it's also very important. Now, when we wait and when we listen, slowly things become clear. Father Richard here, for example. Father Richard guides young men and some not so young men to try and know if God wants them to be priests. And Father Richard could tell you that that takes time and it takes a lot of, the word we use is discernment, trying to sort out what's real gold from what's just noise. And bit by bit, God never forces himself on us, but if we're attentive, it'll come through. Now the funny thing is, God can use all sorts of things to get through to us. He can even use how we feel. He can certainly use what other people say, and he can certainly, as he were, speak to us directly. I'll tell you one story about me, okay? When I was in the seminary, and I was training, preparing to be a priest, for some short time in the seminary, I got very confused and quite unsure of myself. And this is, a true, this is absolutely true. And I would more or less made up my mind that this wasn't right and I ought to leave. And I was trying to work out in my mind how I was going to go and tell the rector of the college that I thought this wasn't working out and I should go. And then a letter arrived and it was an airmail letter and it came from, I can't remember where, but it was from a priest who said that he had heard that I was very unsettled and he wanted to say to me, when you put your hand to the plough, don't turn back or look back get on with it. Now to this day, I do not know who that priest was. To this day, I don't know how he knew. But a letter arrived. And I think God used that letter 
to tell me something. So there's a lot of listening. There's a lot of openness. There's a lot of being still, quite difficult. And then there's also a readiness to be surprised at the way God will guide you in those deep questions about how we should live. Is that a fair answer? Thank you very much, young man. Well done. Well, well I normally pass them to Father John. <laughs> and say, hey, John, what have we got to say about this? <laughs> um, I, think, I think probably the most important thing, but not always very easy, is to try and see the best in the person who's attacking you. You know, uh, to try and um, not be, as you were, distracted by their anger, but to try and get behind that. I think it's St. Ignatius says that, the, that we should always, always, always strive to attribute to another person the best possible motive. We normally, very quickly, attribute to another person the worst motive. But he says, what we should be doing if we're trying, as it were, to be formed in the ways of God is attribute to another person the best possible motive. So I have to try and find the real reason why they're asking this aggressive question. And often then that will take me right to that person's vulnerability. And then I have to try and work with that. From a parents and a family, I think we're very clear and very strong. Um, I think the other thing, and it's probably got a lot to do with why I'm a priest, is that in the parish where I grew up, uh, there was one young priest and one not so young priest, you know, middle-aged priest. And quite frankly, in my eyes, they were the happiest people around. You know, they, they looked content, uh, they worked hard, they had fun, uh, they were often laughing, uh, they were always ready for a tease. They just, you know, had got it together. And I thought, I'd like to live like that. So I think that, that was a big influence. So the people around me, I would say most of all, yeah. I work hard, and my privilege is that my work is directly involved with the things of faith. Uh, I try and make sure I've got time for prayer every day. I'm very lucky I have a chapel in the house where I live. I go to Mass every day, and I try before I go to sleep to kind of wrap up the day in the presence of God. Most of those things I think you could do too. You, d you probably have to, maybe you can't get to church every day, but I think you could probably create your own, what some people call prayer space, a space which is for you a place of prayer. I think somebody said to me once, when it comes to having a habit of prayer, there are two things that are very important. Pray the way in which you can pray. It'll be different for different people. But if you find a way in which you can pray, do it. And the second thing is, do it faithfully. Don't pray for what you can get out of prayer. Don't pray simply because it makes you feel good or you get a bit of a high or whatever. Pray to worship God and do it faithfully, no matter what you get out of it. So I think, I think it is, like most things in daily life, a matter of routine and habit. So you've got to get yourself the right routines and the right habits. And I think within then the community of the church, then you, you can sustain that faith. I'll tell you something else. <laughs> I think this is quite funny. There are two habits. Well, somebody said to me once, you know, it's very good for you to do two things every day that you don't want, that go against the grain. Two things every day. And I said, what are those? And he said, go to bed at the right time and get up at the right time. 
And I think if we do those, then there's a chance that other things will take shape. Some people are good at saying their prayers first thing in the morning. For other people, it's hopeless. But find your time, find your manner, stick to it, give your day a shape by going to bed at the right time and getting up at the right time, and you'll be fine. I would want to say, don't try and be too clever. You know, don't, don't try and conjure up something highly imaginative and surprising, or don't try and be too intense. Don't kind of be somebody who's, oh, you know, as it were, preoccupied. There's a, not a very polite phrase that sometimes people use. Don't come across as a God botherer. You know, somebody who's always bothering God. I think the pathway to faith for your friends can be those that have already hinted at. A, it begins with their sense of unease, their sense of being incomplete, their sense of being, I don't know, you know, not quite at peace with themselves. It can begin with that. The steps are things that are really beautiful that you might share, things that just take you out of yourself, and that's often the appeal of beauty or the example of goodness your own goodness perhaps. And they're the step by step. And then bit by bit you will come to the point where you can begin to talk about your own faith and the person of Jesus. But it's not every day, every time. You've got to wait for the moment when you know that somebody is just kind of a bit curious about what it is. And then you can say, I can tell you if you like. So I think the business of sharing faith actually takes a lot of respect for the other person and you take it at their pace, not necessarily at the pace that I would like to go. And you walk with them step by step and then they're ready for you to introduce him to your beloved friend, Jesus. Here he is. Would you like to meet him? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those questions. Thank you very much for your attention, everybody.